Jean-Paul Enquero is professor of seismology at the California Institute of Technology and joins us now uh, from Pasadena, California. Uh, Jean-Paul, thank you very much for taking time to chat with us. Tony, very sobering report there. We can only imagine what the people are going through now. It's not just going to be petrol or fuel. It's going to be water. It's going to be food. It's going to be a safe place to live. What are people going to have to endure in the coming days ahead? Well, this is going to be a very complicated situation for everyone. And uh, it has been a very confusing situation also because of the tsunami and the uh, vast uh, amount of landslides that have been triggered by this earthquake. And again, we also have to point out the fact that a lot of the survivors there talk about the fact there was just no advanced warning. Uh, you work in the seismology field in a small Pacific island like that. Just talk about the hazards of a massive earthquake and then a tsunami, six meter high wall of water bearing down on people going hundreds of kilometers per hour. Um, what, mm -hmm. are, what, went, what happened firstly and why weren't people notified in advance? Mm -hmm. So technology is great and with technology we can do early warning systems, but we also have natural warnings. So if you are on the beach and you feel shaking from a strong earthquake, you don't have to wait for a warning to come by your phone or by the government. Just run and take protection immediately. You're getting a natural warning from Mother Nature right there. So something that surprised uh, most people is that this kind of earthquakes with horizontal motion mm -hmm. on the fault are very less likely to generate tsunamis than the faults that have vertical motion. That's one of the big surprises here. Well, talk to me more about what happened to the, first the earthquake, 7.5, uh, very powerful earthquake. You talked about having the displacement going in a horizontal fashion. Why is it less likely to trigger a tsunami? So the most efficient way to lift water and then generate a big wave is to move the seafloor vertically, like a piston. If you move it horizontally, other ways of generating a tsunami is by triggering a landslide, a submarine landslide, or by shifting the slope of uh, the seafloor, and that will also generate some vertical motion. Um, so these so-called strike-slip earthquakes, these horizontal earthquakes, uh, produce in general much smaller tsunamis. And the tsunami we've seen here is a very localized mm -hmm. uh, phenomenon. It's not spread over hundreds of kilometers. It also was exacerbated by the shape of the Bay of Palu. Interesting. Uh, also talk about the fact that so many areas are remote and search and rescue teams or search and recovery teams have not been able to get uh, in there. What, uh, you, even being localized, what are the concerns moving forward? So some of the concerns are that uh, communication is lacking and uh, some of the roads may be uh, affected by these uh, big landslides. So it's going to be hard to reach these people uh, by land. Um, this is going to be a problematic situation, yes. You know, everybody has to think back on the horrendous tsunami back in 2004. Contrast and compare the differences in this. I know the last one was, what, 100 feet high or 30 meters high, the tsunami wall of water. Uh, certainly much more punishing than this horrific incident. Mm -hmm. Yes, if we compare those two, these are two kinds of uh, earthquakes and hence two different kinds of tsunamis. The 2004 earthquake over magnitude 9 affected uh, and traveled across the ocean. Uh, the tsunami we've seen a couple of days ago, fortunately, was confined to the Bay of Palu. It was very destructive for that particular city, but it didn't affect the whole region and the whole continent. Mm. Sobering images we're looking at as well. Jean-Paul Ampuero, professor of seismology at uh, Cal Institute of Technology, thanks very much for joining us and helping put this disaster in perspective for us.